Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a superlative honor to be uh, having asked by the Council of the Paradini Medical uh, School and Students Alumni Association uh, to deliver this talk to you tonight. I know the night is a long uh, night, and I thank uh, both the President of the Council and as well as PEMSA, um, my teachers, the chief guest, uh, Professor Neela Kandiratnathunga and uh, Krish for having made all the way from the UK and, la and all of you ladies and gentlemen here tonight. Uh, to take off from where Professor Ratnathunga left in terms of sharing sentiment, I know the night is long, but allow me to share a minute with you uh, about the sentiments that we all would have had on the first day of medical school. It would be uh, just under 45 years when I entered the medical school at Peradenia, a very proud place to be. I was received at the front gate by a senior member uh, of the senior batch, who is now a member of your council, by the way. I shall not name him. And he led me on, not to the medical school, he led me on to the post office uh, that lay on the other side of the Galaha Road. And he took me in there, he bade me to a corner, and he gave me a, a white flower, and he said, can you smell this? And I, and I smelled it and he said, do you recognize the order? Uh, and that felt like the order of a specific body fluid. And I said, yes, uh, in Sinhalese. And he said, good, you have passed test number one. Uh, from that moment onwards, in keeping with your, uh, uh, your meetings uh, uh, a day age, uh, I have uh, been uh, requiring holistic care. Um, is a huge challenge, and uh, he rendered me differently abled from there on. He then, the next question before I got sent off was, what is this tube that lines uh, the chest that delivers food from the mouth of the gullet? And uh, I hesitated a bit, and I said, esophagus, and he said, run off, uh, in the choicest singular language, which I understood, obviously. And I swore to myself that I would never be a specialist in uh, surgery of the esophagus. In fact, I ch chose the southernmost part of the intestinal tract to become a specialist in. And so, whether he knows it or not, I'm delivering and announcing you to you today. That's the whole reason why I ended up being a colorectal surgeon. It's been three decades of battling rectal cancer. And the title, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, arises from a long and arduous battle that this gentleman on your left-hand side, uh, Clint Eastwood, who ran in this film, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly in 1966. Some of you younger colleagues may not uh, uh, recognize him or the film, but certainly recommend you watch it because this is a timely classic, never will go out of function. And then I met Professor Ratnatunga, my teacher, right in the lobby here today, and he mentions uh, the word, obviously he's still, you, he, you understand his youth, and he said, uh, Clint Eastwood said, never let the old man get into you. And that's exactly what it is. So Clint Eastwood has two uh, important things today. He is the source of the title of my talk, and he also uh, delivers a message for the, yeah, for the older people, like some of us and older than us, uh, to understand that youth never dies. Um, so the talk about rectal cancer is a huge one because it affects Sri Lanka in more than one way. It is the second most common cancer in, in women. It's the second, third most con common cancer in men. Overall, for both genders, it's the second most common cancer. 50% of people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, specifically rectal cancer, will only be alive in five years, the others won't be around. It's a huge problem for a cancer that is totally preventable. There is a five-year period between the onset of what is called a polyp, which is a completely benign asymptomatic lesion in the colon that uh, develops over a period of time, just like cervical cancer, to become the, become the cancer and the nasty dis destroyer of human life and family that it has done so far, and we haven't despite all the troubles, gotten over this. So it doesn't matter to me, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether you work in Sri Lanka, or whether you're in the best 
possible places in the United States of America, it still is a challenge. It doesn't matter where you come from. And, I'm, and my, my research and my talk will tell you this. I think if we uh, understand that, then we can do good quality research in this part of the world. There are parts of the world that are developed where research is not possible because society has prevented them from undertaking uh, dangerous parts of uh, cutting edge research purely because they have, if you like, become sissies. Uh, don't allow people to operate on, uh, on animals and dogs anymore, but we are very quick to export monkeys. Uh, so, so you understand the bigotry that happens in the world, but I have to tell you that all of that, including the experiences that we've gained from the world wars, and including our war, have allowed us to uh, improve and, uh, and gain further knowledge into insights of how we can improve and move on with the treatments of what we deal with. This is a paper from the University of Colombo, Professor uh, Samra Sekar's unit uh, is talking about a 10-year history of evaluating patients with colorectal cancer. They went into the Maharagama or the National Cancer Institute's uh, database and just we watched the, 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 the uh, highlighted areas in red circles. It has increased over 10 years, colorectal cancer, I mean. Hasten to add that rectal cancer is two-thirds of all colorectal cancer, and greater in females, the rising rate in females. So I suggest that female colleagues watch out. Your patients are not any less immune from colorectal cancer than your male counterparts. These are uh, the data from the recent uh, NCCI uh, uh, ratings that uh, shows that S Sri Lanka's colorectal cancer problem is now the third most common in the world or in Sri Lanka and its incidence is on the rise by the way. Data from our unit, Professor Pramod Chandra Singh uh, who's now a professor in surgery and uh, uh, holds uh, the colorectal uh, surgical research position there, uh, looked at patients uh, 679 over 18 year period and found the majority of cancers in the large intestine were confined to the left colon and most of these left colon cancers were confined to the rectum. So I have this rule of two thirds. Two thirds of all bowel cancers, large bowel cancers are in the left side of the colon. And of these two thirds in the left side of the colon, the majority, over 66%, are in the rectum, within the reach of the finger that uh, most of us fail to introduce through the anal canal in our busyness of practice, a simple but formidable evaluation. So in currently, colorectal cancer is number three spot in Sri Lankan cancer statistics, up from being the seventh in 2008. So in a, in a sense, we have failed. In 2008, the seventh mo most common cancer, the most preventable cancer, is now third in Sri Lankan rating. So uh, there lies a message. And so there is a cry for help. It is the third most common cancer in Sri Lanka. Over 60% of all large bowel cancers are in the rectum. Females, beware, this is a cancer that has no gender bias. It affects men as well as women. And uh, there is no... Um, postulated theory that hormonal cycles protect you from uh, colorectal cancer. It happens, my, my youngest patient was a female lactating mother, 25 years old, a teacher who presented six months ago with rectal bleeding, who I thought had piles. I'd set her up to do a flexible sigmoidoscopy and manage her piles. Lo and behold, she had a rectal cancer. So please beware. 30% of young people with colorectal cancer, or 30% of all people are young with colorectal cancer. So rectal bleeding is not piles anymore until proven otherwise. And the only way we can prove it is entering the colon through an endoscope and examining it, not by barium exams. Yet, it's the most preventable cancer in the world. So it's unbelievable that we ignore such events. I think our colleagues in cervical cancer have made the grade, but we have failed to. I like to produce this picture 
uh, in order to be able to describe for those uninitiated the origins of colorectal cancer, and that's a beehive there, centered somewhere in that beehive is this queen bee that everyone, every bee looks after. And that's exactly what the intestinal crypt is. If you look on the left-hand side, you see the orange and the blue uh, cellular structures that are depicted, uh, and that's where the colonic stem cell is. Each crypt has a totipotent cell that is the producer of colonocytes. And as they progress on, the colonocytes are pushed up and up until they become the mature colonocytes, which are the green. And every three to five days, these green cells are programmed to undergo a process called suicide, which is apoptosis that we call in medical terms. And it is all genetically managed. It's amazing, isn't it, how creation has given us the ability uh, to shed away the cells that are continuously exposed to carcinogens, bile acids, and have the ability to change to cancer, they get shed in five days. And then on comes a new set of cells. I mean, if, if people don't believe that there is some, some, some power above us, uh, here's an example. We, as human beings, I think, are too big-headed to understand that there is no power mightier than us. And I uh, choose to differ in my experiences and my everyday life uh, of treating patients. So all of this is programmed. If you look on the right side, somehow or the other, there are, there are genes that are called tumor suppressor genes. And these tumor suppressor genes are there to protect genetic aberrations that may produce cancer. And these tumor suppressor genes, even if the cancer gene has been introduced, they can suppress that tumor uh, producing a gene to produce the good gene. And if that does not happen, then apoptosis or suicide does not happen. The cells start mounting on each other, which is what you see on the green side. That is the start to development of what is called a colonic polyp. On the top half of this picture, you will see the progression from initially a whole few cells heaping up to become a small polyp and a large polyp. And from the polyp to the right extreme of your picture where you see the white invasion, which is the full-blown cancer, and that polyp to dysplasia to cancer sequence happens over a period of five years, perhaps younger in younger people, but generally five years. So we have a five-year window in each of us that enables us to undergo colonoscopy, detect the polyp, and to have it removed. The reason why people don't have colonoscopy is because there are no symptoms, and they think this doctor is talking nonsense. Um, I don't have symptoms. Why are they asking me to do this? So if you look at the specimen down there, there's a polyp on the left-hand extreme, asymptomatic. It grows bigger to the second polyp. Again, dysplastic, no, no bleeding. Maybe if you do fecal occult blood testing, you might pick up uh, a positive test that might trigger your requirement for colonoscopy, but most people don't do fecal occult blood testing, and this is a cry out to the general practitioners in this audience. Please do FOBs in patients over 45 years regular, just like cervical screening is done. And once, of course, it becomes a cancer, we are talking a different ball game. We are talking about treatment of established cancer. We are talking about establishment of um, social relationships with one's patient because cancer equals death uh, until proven otherwise. And there's a huge different plan and proposal from the doctor to the, uh, and the treating team to this patient. So uh, it, it's a disaster waiting to happen. And that disaster is made worse if it happens in the rectum. The rectum is beautifully cajoled and protected by this bony pelvis. It, access is terribly difficult. Uh, the only points of access are through the pelvic inlet. And it looks easy here because it's an empty pelvis. But add to that uh, 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 uterus with fibroids in it. Uh, add to that uh, uh, a male pelvis, which is narrow. Add to that an elderly male urinary bladder which has blood outflow obstruction and is enlarged, you don't have space. Uh, fortunately, we had laparoscopy that came in at least 25 years ago. We can now access the depths of the pelvis using slim instruments 
uh, not breaking our backs watching over a screen. So this has been a distinct advantage in the management of rectal cancer in the last two decades. Um, we have that here in Sri Lanka, but it's taken a bit of time, but certainly we have some excellent training programs here within the surgical disciplines of gastrointestinal surgery and colorectal surgery within uh, our Sri Lankan context. Um, as I said, if that red dot or the image is to depict your cancer, that is a relative routine rectal cancer operation for people trained in the process of rectal cancer. But if you push it down, now you're in trouble because you have access problems. You have, what I haven't told you right now, is the ureters, both sides. You have pelvic nerves that go to provide sexual function, healthy sexual function in patients. Uh, and you have the sphincters that prevent you from going from the south end of the pelvis to attack this rectal cancer. So therein lies the problem and therein has been my area of, uh, of research and specialization. How do we get to that rectal cancer right at the bottom of the rectum that will enable us to restore intestinal continuity in our patients? As you know, the treatment for those, or has been since the turn of the 19th or the 20th century, has been a mutilating operation called abdominal perineal resection, which we still tend to do sometimes, but less so now. Uh, the problems of abdominal perineal resection, I happen to see as a young intern on the, on the ward of the Prof. Unit in Peridania with Prof. Aluvihari and uh, the late Dr. Budpitya, bless him. Uh, I am ever so grateful for his, uh, uh, his instruction and his, his teaching that he didn't realize he taught us. Uh, but therein left a peri perineum that was uh, similar to what we saw in bomb-blasted young people, uh, and the patient ended up with a colostomy. At that time, uh, in the 1980s, we had uh, very few appliances that uh, provided patients with a sense of social hygiene and decency, and most of these patients had no education about stoma care. They were, the operation was a success. That was all the end goal of the patient and the, and, the, and the surgical team. The patient went home far and wide, and that led to social ostracization and uh, dim diminution in their quality of life. This is a study from Michael, S Michael Silva when he was with us. Uh, essentially, uh, what we did was ran that paper through uh, what is called a, 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 an IT program that does produce what is called word echo, and you will see that a lot of these words relating, relating to ileostomy and colostomy are negative. So that's, that's the kind of uh, impact that patients uh, are put through and the uh, stomas have on patients. Of course, the quest of continence, um, I halt for a minute to say that the astute medical student, Pere Denier, uh, did not only learn uh, the syllabuses and the syllabi. We learned from the pearls that dropped off our pa pa uh, teachers, parents, I was going to say, our teachers. And if you learn from those pearls, then you picked up a lot more than medical education. And some of the pearls I picked up was in this place. We all know uh, this is the dissecting room of the teaching hospital uh, or, or the medical school at Paradenia. We knew who frequented these places. And one of them was this lady, the lady who would be crisp white, dressed in cotton dress. She often walked across the, uh, the floor with her left hand just lifting her sari right up above the floor uh, as if to say, look, don't mess with me, boy. I'm smaller than you, but listen to what I say. And one of the things that she said in the first week of medical school is in order to be able to excel as a person who treats disease, you absolutely know what, need to know what the normal is. That message ran home deep in my mind, and that's exactly what I did for a few years. In order to be able to understand what I did, you need to also understand that the treatment of rectal cancer has two huge problems. One's if you fix it, there's a huge problem about continence. If you have a colostomy, it's not continent. If you plug it to the bottom and restore continence, 
then the patient's sphincters are probably not going to work so well because we didn't understand sphincters then. And then, of course, if you do, didn't do uh, an operation that resected it with a curative margin, you had local recurrence. And local recurrence in rectal cancer in the pelvis is bad news because the patient's now going to have no surgery or completely mutilating exenteration surgery where we remove the urinary bladder, rectum, and everything inside and give them two stomas, and that's the end of their world. Um, so uh, from 1999, 91 to 94, I spent three years uh, as part of an MD research program at the University of Birmingham uh, studying the anal sphincters. And you understand just from the diagram what, it, what we mean by saying it's an anal sphincter complex. Uh, I was very enthusiastic when I was an intern asking Professor Aluvihari about how he assessed the sphincters because he had done some work uh, on anal sphincters when he was at St. Mark's Hospital and said, looked at me and said, we insert needles in there and we looked at electrical signals and I didn't know what these needles meant but now I know it's uh, electromyography and previously people had a problem finding out the, the structure of the sphincters because there was no imaging, all they had to do is uh, push needles into different parts of the circumference of the perineum and understand that through EMG you could map the presence or absence of sphincter. That made sense, but it did not make sense when you want to reconstruct it. So my research in ultrasound was led by two uh, genius of, uh, uh, of surgeons here at the bottom. On the left is Professor Michael Keithley, who uh, was a world-class expert in, um, in continence, and the right was John Alexander Williams. Uh, at that time, the University of Birmingham and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital was probably the place in England to, to work in to understand, better understand inflammatory bowel disease, uh, continent sphincters, and rectal cancer. And as an MRC fellow, I got given that instruments, the Bruin, Bruin Care endo ultrasound equipment with uh, two probes and said, this is for you not to be used on human beings. Go away, spend the next six months uh, telling me what you have learned about all of the research in anal sphincters and tell me how you can use this to uh, deliver a better understanding of the structure of the anal sphincters. And you wouldn't believe it, but most of my life in the six months was spent in the mortuary because of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital because we had to study fresh cadavers. It was no good going to a cadaveric dissecting room because they had changed, the morphology had changed, the anatomy, it was all post-mortem. Uh, uh, data that we were getting, we did that, but we couldn't get any far. We were required to, I was required to give information on human, live humans, and so the best was to do a cadaver within 12 hours, and that required a lot of logistic support. Uh, ever so grateful to the people in that, uh, uh, in that postmodern room who supported me on that work. And we came out with this prop image. It's the endoanal ultrasound of the internal and the external sphincter. You see the hypoechoic ring, the black ring, which is the internal anal sphincter. It's an involuntary sphincter that keeps you continent when you're asleep at night time. And then you have the mixed echogenic or the white ring around that pretty picture uh, of the external anal sphincter. Once I had done that, uh, Professor Keatley said, now go away, look at all my patients who've had sphincter injuries because that Birmingham was a cent for uh, dealing with incontinence following obstetric trauma. And there were many ladies who had had nasty deliveries, perineal tears, um, forceps assisted deliveries who become incontinent because they had torn their sphincter. And armed with the knowledge of what the normal sphincter is, remember Professor e. G. Eugene Vikram Nayaka, we studied the uh, anal sphincter in these patients and we found, oh, there's, there's the image of the internal sphincter ruptured across one half of the circumference marked by the arrows and that produced uh, uh, data to produce the world's first ever endosonographic image of the correlation between uh, anal sphincters, incontinence and sphincter disruption. All of the work that happened and happens today from anal sphincter uh, structure and uh, evaluation stems from this initial work from us in Birmingham. Um, 
that was not good enough for me because if I thought I was going to go somehow or the other, most people thought I was going to stay back. I had a different mission in mind. I was going to come back home one day, come what may. And I realized that if you, uh, in the process of damage or, or removing these difficult sphincters right at the bottom, if you damaged it, how did you repair it? If you had a neuropathic sphincter, there's no going point having a sphincter there. We need to replace this. And at the time, uh, the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Medical School had advertised for a fellow to work in their research program to, to develop new sphincters. And um, I was very fortunate, obviously. Uh, American fellowships are not easy to get in. I was on their program, and we developed uh, using animal experiments at the start. Again, six to eight months within the labs at the University of Minnesota. Um, working on rabbits, finding out where the sphincter was, denovating the sphincter, and wrapping a new sphincter to understand the concept of the gracilis muscle. And we found that the gracilis, aside from the other sphincter muscles, was probably the most suitable sphincter muscle to wrap around because it was long, slender. If it was disconnected at its distal end, it lent itself to wrapping around the anal canal. And above all, the gracilis did not contribute to the stability of the knee or indeed act significantly to contribute to walking or running. So we used the gracilis sphincter and uh, placed a pacemaker up there because uh, this sphincter for people of, uh, of physiological uh, understanding ha is essentially comprised of the majority of what are fast twitch fibers which are type one, type two muscle. These type two muscles are used in athletes. You run 100 meters, you get, you get tired, the muscle cramps. If you're a 10-kilometer a, 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 a marathon runner, you probably have the indefatigable type 2 muscle. And our aim was to convert type 1 muscle from the gracilis to type 2 muscle using what was uh, at then a cardiac pacemaker. And cardiac pacemakers are still produced in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. So we had to do some dealings with the, uh, with the Medtronic group. And we got these cardiac pacemakers, and we fixed it onto the muscle. And over a period of six months, we found that there was a significant type, one, type 2 to type 1 conversion, making the uh, gracilis muscle uh, similar to the anal sphincter that is uh, uh, short of fatigue. Having done that, uh, I was armed to my teeth with the knowledge of anal sphincters. If the sphincters went wrong, I knew where it was. If the sphincters were not talking to each other, I knew why. Uh, if the sphincters had been damaged, I knew how, what to put, do with it and put it right, so I came back. I came back to Sri Lanka. Been about 15 years since I left Para Denia, and then worked hard on neo sphincters and the continent's work. Uh, fortunately for me, unfortunately for the country, there were a number of young people, soldiers, uh, combatants, both sides of the divide, who had bottom ends blasted as a result of the Johnny Mines, and they were lent to have permanent colostomy. So we offered the army and all the social organizations, look, we can fix this. We can create what is an abdominal stoma into a perineal stoma, give it a while, wrap the gracilis, and then let's see how it goes. And the bottom line of the World Journal of Surgery modified dynamic gracilis neosphincter is a paper that resulted from that. Remember at that time, a pacemaker was 1.5 million rupees uh, in Sri Lankan, and we could not afford that. So we modified it. I'm not going to spend time. You can read the paper. Uh, and we had a good 70, 80% success rate. Uh, this paper forms the basis for all of the gracilloplasty work that gets done in South Asia today, and in fact, Asia now. Uh, uh, so then, once we did that, for those of you people who had rectal cancer involving the sphincter, we could not preserve the sphincter. We removed the whole thing, did an AP resection, joined uh, the colostomy to a perineum, and did what was called a total anal reconstruction after APR, wrapping the gracilis. Not great results, but semblance was enough for people who did not want to have colostomies. And not only did we do some of them here, but the India's first for this low rectal cancer was done by yours truly and in the team in India at the Tata Memorial Hospital for which they're ever so grateful. But they do not publish my name on it because they say that's the Tata policy. We don't uh, have anything outside Tata doctors who will write this paper. So I said, fine. Uh, 
Now, when you've got something at the back end, it's like a crab clawing at your back, right? And uh, in, in, in the process of developing this sphincter and converting it to a type one muscle, we used a technique called biofeedback. The brain is an untapped resource, and we understand that if you keep feeding the brain, keep teaching the brain and teaching it time and again, it soon learns. And soon these people with these sphincters were able to, uh, to, to gather a degree of continence that were unbelievable. And the people who helped out there was uh, Nalin the Munasinghe on the left. He is now a senior lecturer in uh, breast and endocrine surgery. And the great lady on the right was the uh, Geetani uh, Ratnayak, who most G GI surgeons, physicians know, and stoma nurses know. She kind of the first, uh, first stoma care nurse in Sri Lanka, certified by the international organization. She spent a lot of her time, does spend her time uh, teaching and propagating stoma care in Sri Lanka. We now have a diploma course uh, as a post-basic post nurse training school course that uh, provides diplomates in stoma care. And so stoma care is well and alive. People don't have to wear the banana leaves and the, and the coconut shells and all of the silly, silly bags that they used to use those days. We really have stoma care bags that can be produced at low cost and patients get taken care of in the privacy of their homes because of stoma care nurses across this country. Uh, we need to be grateful to Gitani. I said it's mutilating, it defaces you, it's very upsetting, and local recurrence is a huge problem. So um, we looked at why and what happens. He, most people thought that if you did an AP resection, you would get rid of the cancer and if that was the best deal. But we found that in this paper, they had local recurrence rates of 47% of almost one half of people who got the AP resection also got uh, local recurrence. Now, not only are we giving these people uh, a mutilating operation that probably took them off their lifespans and their life tracks, but also gave them, a few years later, gave them recurrence. That was not good enough. And so we studied this in detail and wanted to know why. And uh, the question is exactly there. Why 5% in some, and why 47% or 50% in others? And this is the answer. If you have a cancer within the rectum, and it spreads onto the outside of the rectum, which is enveloped by this fatty layer, if you can take that cancer out one piece with a two millimeter margin, you'll get a 5% recurrence. If the surgeon, out of lack of knowledge, or is careless, and removes it with uh, the incision going through the tumor, you get a 45% recurrence. And so, uh, we had ways of looking at it in Minnesota. We looked at it with ultrasound, uh, but we found that ultrasound is good for close vision, but not for distant vision, whereas MRI gave you a whole picture of what's going on. So you have what is like a globe, uh, Google map of the rectum, uh, the prostate gland, vagina, if you like, and the bladder, and we know exactly how to plan and when to plan and what to plan. Ultrasound at that time was fine for close vision, but you can see that on the left-hand side, that ultrasound didn't give you the images of the prostate gland and the urinary bladder and the vagina, if you like. Um, we also then took on the work. Uh, I think you'll be proud, uh, Prof. Ratnatunga and uh, the chief guest tonight. This is your son. He did a lot of the work with pelvic floor uh, dynamics. Uh, and Kesara was, when he was with us a registrar, he um, looked at uh, dynamic, not only structure, but also function of the pelvic floor. How could we look at this better? And we produced a protocol for dynamic MRI of the pelvic floor, which most people use now. Um, if that was not good enough, we looked at local recurrence in rectal cancer. And there, are, uh, there is uh, this paper uh, that said that if you have a positive resection margin in and that alone is the single factor affecting local recurrence of rectal cancer. Proud to say again that this paper was produced by the first author was Buddhika Dasanayaka, who's here. Uh, both Kesara and Buddhika are great alumni of uh, Paradenia, and they also serve in the Paradenia uh, Medical School as surgeons. Uh, very proud that you come through our projects and uh, develop some critical thinking skills. And so uh, when Buddhika produced this paper, we also had uh, uh, methods of thinking of how, if you have uh, a tumor that uh, arises on the outside of the fat, 
uh, you're going to have to re push that back in one way or the other because if you don't, there's no space down there. You have to do something and that's when radiation came in and we used radiation to push back the tumor uh, and what we found was long course radiation uh, from my work in the US uh, pushed the tumor back which means it downstaged the tumor and also made this tumor small, which means downsize the tumor. Once you have a downstage, downsized tumor, you push the back tumor back to its original limits where you now have the potential for uh, delivery of a safe margin. Uh, so that, in essence, was the work. We're talking about film here. Uh, if you know what uh, Clint Eastwood said, here's the dirty dozen, and I'd like you to, uh, uh, to introduce you to all those uh, unsung workers who are now uh, successful people in their part of the world uh, who were the dirty dozen, all of them were first authors uh, of papers and we produced a lot of papers in rectal cancer and that's them. So on the top row, uh, I'll spend a minute if I may, is Tamar Pereira. Tamar left us. He's now the professor of uh, liver transplant surgery at the University of Birmingham. Uh, proud product of Kalanir. The second person next to Thamar is Michael Silva, left us again after all of that training. Uh, Michael heads the hepatobiliary and pancreatic team at the Oxford NHS Trust. The third person also left us, he did, they didn't like me after they left, uh, finished their research. Uh, Ruan Vijay Surya, bright guy from Colombo, uh, again did all the work on lymph nodes in rectal cancer, uh, radiation therapy, and he left. Uh, he's now a, a, a fully fledged practicing consultant in the teaching system in Perth. Thomas Poskus is, uh, was a foreign fellow who worked with us for a year. Uh, Thomas left to his country. He's now the professor of surgery in Lithuania. Uh, the fifth person is uh, the actor. Uh, he's Pulatis Siriwadana, again, uh, the son of a proud alumni, first batch of Peridine, Dr. S.S. Jairatna. Uh, Pulatis is left me again, left us, and he is now the reader of, in surgery in the hepatobiliary unit at the Royal Free Hospital. Ku Chan was a visiting fellow. He is now an academic surgeon in Johor Bahru in Malaysia. Uh, the rogue on the left bottom is Buddhika Dasanayaka. Uh, he's changed since. He's grown his hair now. I can't recognize the guy. Uh, but he produced the work on all the margin resection, Kesara Ratnatunga produced a couple of books actually, ch book chapters on rectal cancer, and also did all the pelvic flow work. Uh, Vasanta Bijenaik in the middle uh, looks like Telly Savalas. Uh, for those of us who know Telly Savalas or Yul Breiner, he now heads the Department of Surgery at KDU. And the last three, Rohan Siriwa, then a um, professor of surgery, the person who did the first liver trans live donor liver transplant, still at Ragama, Pramod Chandrasinghe is doing very active work in rectal cancer, also at Ragama, and Sumudu Kumarage, they form the, the core of the GI uh, operating system and also the um, uh, research uh, front at Ragama, uh, place that I serve with love. So after all of that, this paper is going to be coming out in 2023 published in the BMC Cancer, and basically what we've done is found that the overall local recurrence, refer you to the arrows in the last two sentences, the overall local recurrence from an unacceptable 50% to an acceptable 10% is now to 6.5%. And that has come out of multidisciplinary teamwork. Uh, the picture you see is that of Professor Janaki Heber Vicente. She's a pathologist who's been with me for 21 years in all of this research work, so she's an author of every paper that we produce. She's now the dean, an unvoiced person, but uh, my gratitude goes out to her. So what I was uh, re referring to at the start is very much what I'm saying now. I think you need to be brave to be an academic surgeon on the front line pushing the envelope. If you don't get there, you will never get there. Uh, patients will never get there in the end, or you won't push the frontiers of medicine and surgery. And I think there has to be a degree, degree of risk taking in this balanced risk, if you like, and the statement arises from that experience. Physicians must be able 
to practice medicine that is informed by their years or other years of medical education, training, experience, and the available evidence freely and without threat of punishment, harassment, or retribution, much of what we see on social media today. Uh, I think if we, don't, if we don't heed to these words, medicine will just fade off into being uh, just an everyday person's job. Everyone will be a medic. Nobody will be really pushing the envelope and taking uh, our medical uh, skills right to the extremes. I think the quest of excellence arises from just in that dissecting room, which you don't have anymore, but the similar things. Uh, in order to be able to uh, provide uh, excellent uh, care, you need to have excellent data. Uh, and uh, in order to be able to have that, you have to have the heart for excellence in research. And it is now my dream, as I see medical education fading off into uh, what is uh, uh, something that I can't and cannot understand. Uh, we, I think in my mind, and I'm very open about what I say, uh, we are creating average, run-of-the-mill doctors by this new medical curricular method, by the number of people we have in medical schools. Uh, when I was a professor of surgery at Kalanir, we had a whole uh, entourage of previous uh, PGIM chair people coming up and visiting us and vice chairman and saying, what is it that we want in Kalani? I said, please, can you reduce the numbers? When I was in medical school at, in 1978 to 83, we had 98 in a batch. We had seven teachers in surgery. In 2020, we have 250 in a batch, seven teachers. How do you expect medicine to be taught? I am seriously thinking of getting some smart colleagues together with some business brains and starting the first internet school of medicine in Sri Lanka and for the world, really, because you can do that on the internet. You don't want uh, medical schools for this. So that is my dream. If, for instance, the medical education unit at Peradine, please do this, please take heed. If you can develop a team that identifies bright students and develop critical thinking Within that student for the five years, you have produced at least a few who will take our profession to a next level. Otherwise, we will stay where we are and everything else will happen uh, as per everything else that happens. Uh, very grateful to some of those teachers who really touched my heart uh, and gave me some, some important stuff. Uh, Professor Barnaboke, I don't need to point to the, these gentlemen and the lady because you all know them. Professor Panabuke had this knack. I was just a third year medical student, um, uh, sitting in his pathology uh, class, right at the back, but could hear him. He had this knack to take uh, a formerly failed specimen of what for me was a piece of uh, dead wood, really, and he would be able to describe every detail of that. He would be, ex be, be able to describe the front, the anterior, the north, the south, the posterior, and every aspect, and come up with a specimen that made sense. And that got my thinking, that you need to be critical, you need to be observant. And, uh, and although I am not a pathologist, his teaching taught me something that I carry on today. The gentleman down in the bottom is Professor Nimal Serenayake, again, a, a respected teacher of mine, and Professor Shanti Mendes, both of them, at a very young age of mine, taught me about data science. They taught me about how to manage data, uh, how to be a scientist despite the fact that you are a busy clinician, and to operate data in a way that meant meaningful uh, messages to the, to the people. Uh, the gentleman right on the top left is Professor Aluihare. Uh, he has his finger pointed to wherever, whether if it's not in the anal canal, it's at you. And, uh, and what I've done with those two fingers in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the cartoons there, he had this trick. Uh, you can't, Professor Sergei can't do this trick anymore. He had you in the ward class, he had this test tube full of urine. Uh, they used to do Benedict's testing. Uh, but he had this test tube full of urine and he put his middle finger in and he tasted his index finger. And if you were not smart enough, you would put your hand and say, do it now. And if you were not smart enough, you put your middle finger in and test the urine. Of course, for a first start, you can't test uh, urine taste for sugar, uh, you need to know that, so that's a 
complete crash of basic science. And the third thing, of course, the second thing is that you got to observe him. And he taught me the powers of observation. He taught, the, taught me that if you're not observant, you don't make the grade, and that was it. So he taught me a lot. And of course, the gentleman right down the bottom, uh, a revered and respected teacher, Prof Ratnatunga. Prof Ratnatunga was silent. He'd work, he'd work, and he'd work. And he taught me that surgery has got to be your first wife. Surgery has got to be your second wife. You, surgery has got to be a third wife. And being a Muslim, uh, I'm allowed four wives. Uh, I'm sorry about that. And my good wife, Shanaz, was my fourth wife. She really is my wife. Uh, and I'm ever gr so grateful to you for having endured all those difficult days, or tough days for me when I spent in Ragam. I used to leave home at 6 o'clock, have dinner every night at 1 o'clock, but produce these wonderful people who are now here to take on uh, the role of what we undertook many years ago. Remember, everything leaves a mark. Um, so whilst my teachers have left a mark on me, I, I can only think that I have left a mark on them to take this to a different level. But also, the encouraging thing from this cartoon is that although when we were young, we, we used to think about, hey, how, how are you going to live as a surgeon for the rest of your life? You, you, know, you become de-skilled, your dexterity goes away, uh, whereas if you become physician, you can at least see patients So uh, you know, when you're 65 years and older. But here it is. Uh, after this, we have enough skill now to become a tattoo artist, and this is an advertisement for surgeons. You have a job waiting for you. Thank you for your attention.